part two, further analysis and discussion. Okay, so I think we'll start with the uh, first question, as uh, usual. And this comes from uh, John Paul Stutheridge. Uh, we've adapted the question here for the purposes of uh, being concise and, I guess, accurate or something like this. Mm. Uh, so we apologize if we're putting in words into your mouth, John. But uh, essentially, we guess he wrote in with an An Anselmian great-making argument, which can be something like follows. God is that which nothing can great can be conceived. It is greater to be maximally good than maximally evil. Suppose that God is maximally evil. Well, then there's a greater conceivable being than God, namely a being that is maximally good, not maximally evil. But this is a contradiction, right? So our assumption was false, i.e. that... Uh, God is maximally evil. So if God's not maximally evil, we should accept, because the assumption was false, that uh, God is maximally good. I guess that's the uh, ontological argument in favour of a uh, maximally good God. How would you then uh, respond to this argument, Stephen? Or what do you think of it? Right, well, it's not in the paper. Um, I briefly consider ontological arguments, um, and I point out that, um, you know, some of the most obvious mm. examples can be flipped so you know a simple anselmian sort of argument goes you know i can conceive of a, a maximally uh great god or good god mm -hmm. and uh given that it's 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 greater to exist in my imagination it's even you know, it's even better for it to exist in so in reality than in my imagination mm -hmm. i can conclude that this thing really exists um, and then a mirror version of that would be, well, I can conceive of a maximally evil being, and it would be even more evil for that being to exist in reality than merely in my imagination. Therefore, the maximally evil being must exist. So, so those two arguments are, appear, at least in that, you know, in the, in that very simple form to be symmetrical. Um, what's going on here is that we're being given by, um, I can't see the name of the person. Oh, John, John Paul Stuthridge. We're being given an another argument, which I don't mm -hmm. consider, um, which is, um, not the standard ontological argument. It's no. got an extra premise in premise two. It is greater to be maximally good than it is to be maximally evil. Um, if you stick that one in, um, then you do get an asymmetry again, obviously. Mm. Um, that's why he's put it in. <laughs> um, is it, um, is it, uh, so it's, you know, that's, that's, that's an interesting way to go. You could potentially, I mean, I don't claim in the paper that all ontological arguments fail. I just mm. point out that, you know, the standard Anselmian one can be flipped. So mm. clearly, if, you know, the, the flipped version is no good, then the, the standard version presumably is no good either. But maybe, um, there are good ontological arguments and, you know, Alvin Plantinga famously mm. offers a whole bunch of them. And then I know Alexander Pruss has been uh, developing them, and I, I haven't spent much time on any of that stuff, so I'm not really in a position, mm. to be honest, mm. at this point to so, say, yeah, and they're all rubbish because. <laughs> um, so, uh, it, yeah, this would be a way to go, wouldn't it? Try and establish an asymmetry mm. between the two hypotheses by coming up with a, uh, an, arm, an, a, an armchair, a priori proof of the mm. existence of a good God, because then you could say that... Um, whilst there is indeed considerable evidence provided by observation mm. against this God, given that we have a proof mm. uh, of the existence of a good God, we know that there must then be some good reason for all of these evils, even mm. if we don't know what it is. So you could you could take something like that line. Um, is the argument that we've got here a good ontological argument? Well, I mean, you know, even most theists don't think the ontological <laughs> arguments are very good, usually when you ask them. So... I rather, you know, personally, I rather doubt it. But uh, it's an interest. It's an, it, 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 it shows that, you know, there are potentially asymmetrical ontological arguments. Mm -hmm. That's something that you could, mm, could, that's an option you could pursue. Could this one simply be mirrored by changing premise two to it is great to be maximally evil than maximally good? Of course, it, yeah. of course it could, yeah. So presumably, so the onus is very much on the person offering this argument to mm. come up with some reason for supposing that the, semis, the second premise is true. How, how do you um, consider this? Because this is a question I know you've answered answered before. The response is something like this, the evil God challenge. Evil is solely the absence of good. So yes. therefore, if God's the maximally greatest being, surely, Stephen, you're wrong. He can't be maximally evil because he's you've already told me he's the maximally yeah. greatest being. So can we just say it's evil is greater than good? 
Uh, well, you, yeah, you could try something like that. I mean, the, the, this is where things get very complicated very quickly. Um, and, you know, the work of Thomas Aquinas and people like that it inevitably starts cropping up here mm. and it all gets very involved and convoluted. Um, d- d- so we can't go into loads of detail and depth. But I guess what we can say about the privation view of evil, which mm. you might trot out here, you might say, well, look, here's an asymmetry between good and evil. Evil is an absence or, or better, um, a privation of good. So, you know, think of something like um, blindness, mm. right? Mm-hmm. That's an evil. It's not an evil in a brick, right? Uh, but it is an evil in a human being. Why? Well, because human beings are supposed to be mm-hmm. sighted. And here is a an absence or a privation of something, a good, that, that, that they should have. Mm-hmm. And this, then, you might generalize this point and say, well, that's true of, of evils generally. They're always a, an absence or a privation. So the the universe, for the universe to contain evil is really for it to contain absences. It's a bit like um, a Swiss cheese, you know. It's got various holes in it, and those holes are the evils. Mm-hmm. And they're not something positive in their own right. They're merely absences or privations of, of goods. So that's a view which, you know, some people take so far as evil is concerned. But I mean, even in theological circles, this is highly contentious. And I, you know, there are plenty of philosophers of religion that reject the privation view. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, you could, you could appeal to the privation view in order to try and develop some kind of, um, argument. I pointed out why, if you were to try and show that there's some logical problem, logical contradiction involved in the idea of an evil god, Maybe using the privation view of evil, you might say, well, the very idea of a maximally evil god is nonsensical because mm-hmm. evil is a privation. So a maximally evil god would be a non-existent god, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, an absence rather than a presence. Mm-hmm. Um, so you could try something like that. But that's just to take the route that we've already discussed of trying to show that there's a logical problem with the very idea of an evil god. And that by itself actually doesn't really deal with the, the evil god challenge at all. Um, what's going on here though is something slightly different here we're we're suggesting not that there's a logical problem with an evil god but that there's a logical case an a priori armchair case for a good god which cannot be mirrored by an argument for an evil god and and you know that's that's a route that you could take you know good luck with it (laughs) uh and you know it's Highly controversial, mm-hmm. even amongst religious philosophers, whether or not anything like that is going to mm-hmm. succeed. But you know, maybe you could make something like that succeed. Yeah. Okay, how about the second objection then? Uh, the objection that the world contains significantly more good than evil. So I guess the argument would go something like this. One, the world contains significantly more good than evil. Premise two, only a good God would design and then create a world which contains significantly more good than evil. And hence, you know, a good God designed and therefore created the world. What do you think to this potential uh, response to the argument, Hmm. Stephen? Well, that's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, Both the premises seem quite dubious to me. Mm. (laughs) Um, So premise one, the world contains significantly more good than evil. Um, is that true? I mean, it's very difficult to establish whether mm. or not that is or is not true because good is not the sort of thing which is easily quantifiable and neither is evil. You can't put it on a scale, can you, and measure how much no. you've got. So you would have to make the case for that. So, you know, it's certainly, it's a, you know, we could certainly question that first premise. Um, there are, you know, moments in our lives which are good, uh, but there are for many, many people, you know, life is just endless mm. bloody misery, frankly. Mm. Um, and pretty much everyone bows out, you know, in pain, suffering. Um, it's not a good ending. Uh, do you, can you really make a case for this being on, on balance and much, you know, there's much more good than there is evil in the world? I think that when you look at the animal kingdom mm-hmm. in particular, um, the, the, the extent of suffering that there is there, it would be particularly hard, I think, to make the case there that yeah. um, there is more good than evil. I suspect that actually there's probably considerably more evil than there is good, actually. 
Um, it's quite nice for us recently living in the home counties with the NHS, mm. uh, comparatively speaking, mm. um, life can be reasonably good for many of us. Um, but if you take a step back, I think that you can see that probably there's more evil than good. Mm. Can I play the sceptic on, on a couple of points? Is that okay? Okay. So referencing earlier, you made an appeal to trans-historical human suffering, i.e. it's been horrific for the vast majority of human history. I think uh, you might have quoted him before, Kenneth Hill, population expert, thinks that yes. deaths might have been in between a third and a half for everyone born before the age of three or four, something like this. And yeah. as you explained earlier, this can be horrific. And we've got suffering in the animal kingdom too. Animals tearing each other limb from limb for 4.54 billion years. Now, the two responses mainly for this. I'll take the, the one which you've been posed before, as I know, in a debate with William Lane Craig. And <laughs> mm. he, he referenced, um, you know, it seems that w animals have been spared the feeling <laughs> of pain yes. uh, that you attribute to them. God has spared them this pain. They don't have, I'm not sure what he labels it, maybe you can remember, but they don't experience pain like, like we do. And therefore, he essentially said your point was void. An animal doesn't yes. feel pain. So you can't appeal to that suffering yes. in the world. How would you... First, can I give the second one, just so you've got both? Okay. And the <laughs> the human point, it's it's something like this. If if the world is so bad, you know, there's I've got some statistics here. 65 million people in the UK and only 6,639 reported suicides in 2015. Hmm. So if the world is so filled with so much evil as you appeal to, Yes. Why, why is it that uh, we don't see more suicides? I guess so. There's two responses there. Animals oh, don't okay. feel pain, and if there's that much evil, then yeah. why, why do people carry on waking up in the morning? Yeah. Why? Well, yes. If it's also awful. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, if you're a really evil god, what you'll do is you'll make life absolutely horrendous, but you'll also give people a very powerful drive to continue to exist, no matter how horrendous it gets, because that's going to maximise the horrendousness. And so, the mere fact that people don't kill themselves on mass is not really very, very much evidence against mm. life being uh, you know, very largely pretty pretty unpleasant. Mm. Um, the, the claim that animals don't feel pain in the sense that, you know, they suffer horribly, um, well, you'd need some science to back that up. And I think William Lane Craig um, made some appeal to some science, but on closer examination it turns out to be baloney, and various scientists have pointed that out now. So... Mm. You know, there isn't a good case to be made for animals not suffering mm. horrendously. Um, I think you would be <laughs> hard-pressed to defend that mm. uh, scientifically. You could say, okay, well, they suffer then, but, you know, they get adequately compensated uh, later on. They get to go to heaven too. Some people mm. think their pets are going to be with them in heaven. You could, you could maybe take that kind of line. It seems highly plausible to me, though, that there's a sort of heaven for t the T-Rex and the Velociraptor and... <laughs> The chicken and uh but you could go that way <laughs> maybe i think i think so i think of, there's been a book published recently by a philosopher called trent doherty which okay i'm mm. i'm i'm horribly caricaturing that suggestion but i think he has a go at, at, at defending something along these lines mm. yeah interesting so say if uh, i went home this evening and walk into to my uh, to my flat and i look around the room and i find that everything's lovely and cleaned up, everything's looking fantastic, it looks like things have been polished, but I find some broken mugs and some uh, other smashed things in the corner. Now, I've got two hypotheses. One, either my mum's popped round and she's cleaned up and she might have broken a couple of mugs along the way, maybe to help me appreciate what it's like to have working mugs, or is it a burglar that's came in, a malevolent burglar? <laughs> I guess the theist uh, point on this criticism, and it's one which is overlooked, I think, in the literature and people that may have responded to it, it's often articulated it poorly, if I, if I don't mind saying. I think someone responded to your paper, The God of F. Do you remember the, so oh, the very, very early version of this, yes. Someone respond, The yes. main response was uh, something like this. Theists don't make a case for a good God by observing yeah. the world around them. No, of course but, they don't. The but part. if we try and do that, say we yeah. take the, the flat example, you know, we, surely it's more likely that my mum's cleaned the flat than, than some evil. <laughs> evil. Uh, so do you reject the, the analogy or, or do you think well, you could still have an argument for the existence of an evil, evil mum? Or yeah, yeah. Well, well, first of all, I'm not suggesting that Christians... And Jews and Muslims make the case for a good God based on observation of the world around them. I just don't 
think that's very plausible. I mean, I know they'll still sing songs about, you know, all things bright and beautiful and bang on about <laughs> how lovely it all is. But, you know, most of them are more, <laughs> more are very much aware that actually, uh, life can be pretty <laughs> horrendous for all the lovely butterflies and bugs and so on, no matter how pretty they might look. Um, I don't think that is the reason that most people believe in a good God. They don't believe that God is good because they look around them and go, wow, this is so great. It must have been made by a good God. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm not supposing otherwise. What I'm doing is I'm pointing out that there's an enormous amount of pain and suffering, evil on a, you know, li- literally unimaginable scale, running back hundreds of millions of years. And that this, on the face of it, is very good evidence against the good God hypothesis. And um, it seems to me that that is very good evidence, whether or not you can point to some good stuff and say, oh, well, here's, a, here's, 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 here's some reason to believe in the good God. I didn't. I never thought that that's, that was the reason that people did believe in the good God. Mm-hmm. I think the reason people believe in the good God is probably, it's, it's much not, first of all, it's much nicer to believe in the good God. Mm-hmm. Um, secondly, um, you can sort of, you can mine um, ancient greek philosophy and find resources there for, for marshalling some kind of argument for why for why if there is a creator he's going to have to be good mm. um you know sort of thomist type arguments you could go that route and also i suspect when people experience god they have an experience of something good that's how god strikes them mm. um i think it's probably that kind of reason so on on the last point so obviously mm. on evil god uh, defenders reasoning we can just say that he wants you to experience a good god so he can take that away or something he's, he's deceiving you that's what an evil god would do mm-hmm. on the earlier point just because this is one we'll, we we can address now rather than later is uh, something like pragmatic encroachment or the idea that it's worthy of worship i think keith ward is, who we're going to reference in a second makes this argument a good god is worthy of worship an evil god is not so your question Stephen, is why favor one over the other well it would be absurd to me to favour an evil god. <laughs> do you think this is a good... Does this defeat the symmetry thesis, or do you have any empathy for this view at all? Well, it doesn't on the face of it seem to be a reason for supposing that one belief is more likely to be true than the other. Um, it's just a reason for, you know, believing one rather than the other because it's going to cheer you up a bit, uh, at least in the short term. I mean, you know, I can convince myself that I'm going to win the lottery next week and that will make me feel much, much better. <laughs> um, but it doesn't give me the slightest reason to suppose that it's true. So insofar, I mean, may, maybe I'm caricaturing poor old Keith's point here, but, but, you know, insofar as one God hypothesis is far more attractive and one God is rather more worthy of our worship than the other. Yeah. But, you know, that doesn't give me the slightest reason to suppose that one of these gods is more likely to exist than the other one. I guess the third objection is another one from uh, Keith Ward, and this argument says, well, you know, starts on the proviso, let's say, that because God is omniscient, uh, God's omniscience involves uh, sharing my experiences or feeling my pains as such. So uh, when a human feels pain, God feels their pain. When a human feels happy, uh, God feels happy, something like this. An omnipotent being would not choose to feel pain. An omnipotent being would only choose to feel pleasure. A good God has reasons to make humans happy, namely because it would make itself happy. On the other hand, an evil God would not have reason to cause pain, as it has no reason to desire the feeling of pain and cause itself the feeling of pain. It follows from this that the good God hypothesis is reasonable and the evil God hypothesis is highly unreasonable. Uh, have you come across this argument before, Stephen? Um, uh, if I have, it? I've forgotten about it. <laughs> yeah, so, well, the conclusion is that um, it follows that the good God hypothesis is reasonable and the evil God hypothesis is highly unreasonable. And if I've understood the argument correctly, the suggestion is a god is never going to choose to inflict pain. Upon themselves. As well. uh, because, yeah, because... If they're inflicting it upon others, then they're inflicting it upon themselves. So the very idea of a god that would do that makes no mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if if that's the objection, then this is just an, yet another one of those logical objections. Uh, we're pointing out that the very idea of an evil god makes no sense. Mm. Um, 
but as I've already pointed out, um, that's not really in a response to the evil god challenge as I set it up. You know, why is it that, you know, if this is excellent evidence against an evil god, the goods that we observe in the universe around us, then why aren't the goods that we observe excellent evidence against, an, uh, um, the evils that we observe excellent evidence against a good god? So, yeah, so this is just another one of those logical objections, I think, given mm-hmm. that I've understood mm-hmm. the so- argument. Correctly. Of course, it also depends on some questionable claims. Um, you know, if I suffer, well, God is suffering along with me, whether, mm-hmm. you know, whether, whether he's good or evil, he's going to be suffering as mm-hmm. an, as an omnipotent being, an, an, an omniscient, omniscient being. Yeah. Well, his omniscience doesn't require that, um, he have my suffering. It just requires that he knows that I'm suffering. <laughs> um, it's not at all clear to me. That how anyone could mm. feel my pains along with me, if that's how we're going to think about pains mm. as being something to which you alone have kind of privileged access. It's not clear that even God um, will be able to experience pain mm. without himself being a human being. I think sometimes religious people say that, and that's why he became a human being. Mm. So he could experience pain uh, and suffering and also the, the other things that we can experience along with us. It, it allows him that access mm. that otherwise would not be available to him. But Keith's argument here seems to presuppose that, nevertheless, no God does know what it's like. Um, indeed, if I'm in pain, God's in pain. You know, if I've got a pain in my toe, God's got a pain in well, God's somewhere. <laughs> God's toe, my toe. God's got a God's feeling a pain in my toe. Yeah. Is he? Does this even make sense? I'm not sure it does. Mm. In which case, yeah, the, the, you know, the objection doesn't really get off the ground. But my point is, my fundamental point is this: even if the objection did get off the ground, um, it doesn't really deal with the. If, with the the evil god challenge as I set it up. Let us pause for a moment and hear a quick message from our sponsors, the New College of the Humanities. My name is Jess. I'm a third year student here at NCH, which means I only have nine months left, which is really sad. I study philosophy with English and I'm also the president of the student union. There are many ways you can get involved with the union. One is you can come to our meetings. We're always welcome to having guests. We actually really love it. You could join the events committee, which works alongside the events officer to plan everything that happens in NCH. Elections happen at the end of the first term. So you'll have had an entire term to settle in, to figure out where your place is in NCH. And then you can run for a position on the union yourself. Like many students, my first year at university was a bit of a challenge. I experienced some mental health difficulties. I started um, experiencing anxiety and had the occasional panic attack. And being at NCH, I received the most incredible support I could have ever wanted. My friends and my fellow students who I wasn't even that close to were always there for me. And the systems that we have in college are fantastic. Liberal arts inspired degrees in the humanities and social sciences. Gold standard teaching with one to one tutorials and small interactive seminars. Lectures by world renowned professors including A.C. Grayling, Daniel C. Dennett, and Steven Pinker. You can still apply directly to NCH London for 2018 entry and be considered for a scholarship. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk forward slash pensycast. NCH London. Unique degrees for curious minds. The link to reach the new College of the Humanities is in our iTunes description and on our website. Right, back to the discussion. So the majority of the responses, which are logical in this way, assume, well, maybe not assume, but they're saying that no rational being would want to feel people suffering. No rational being, another one from Keith Ward, is that an evil god must be diseased because only an evil god would wish to inflict this much pain. For me, and appreciate your thoughts on this, Stephen, depending on how well I state it, but it's something like this. An evil god would want to feel the pain because that's precisely what gives it pleasure. And an evil god (laughs) is not diseased. The evil god, it's greater to be evil. It seems like to be good is to be diseased on the evil god defender's um, hypothesis. So I I referenced Hayron earlier when I said Tony Soprano. So we've got a frequent evildoer there, but a real evildoer. They don't do it for power, as Keith Ward suggests in another one of his responses. They don't do it for some other end. True evil consists in doing something for the sake of evil, and to really relish in that is to feel the evil. Abram gives another example of 
uh, a man called Chad who's played by Aaron Eckhart in an old uh, old film called In the Company of Men. And he's a really good person. He seems like he's a really morally virtuous, perfect example of a, a good model citizen. But behind the scenes, you see the workings of his mind, and it's really good how they portray it. Really, he's the most evil person imaginable, and he wants people to suffer. And when he, he tricks a disabled woman um, into the office, into falling in love with them, and he plays a game with his workmates into, into getting her to fall in love, and the whole film's building this up, this relationship. And then there's a moment in the film towards the end where he, where she finds out or he tells her. And he, he scrutinizes her face and scrutin, uh, Habron gives the quote, uh, something like, like one would an insect. He wants to relish in the pain because this is what he's doing, the things he's doing for. So is it, w- why would an evil God not want to feel the pain? That's the only reason he's doing it. That, that's his motivation. So he wants to feel pain and he's not diseased. It's greater to, to do this it seems mm. like it's a mischaracterization of what an evil god is yeah Ooh, that's how, an interesting get, question. Can I ask the question how would an evil god act on the evil god defenders um account well you can have all sorts of explanations i mean um you know just as there are endless versions of god depending on which religious person you talk to so you know you could have countless uh versions of evil god um on some versions he might be some sort of masochist mm. that kind of um gets off on the pain and experiencing the pain with you on others he may be a sadist um his enjoyment comes from seeing others suffer he does not want to suffer himself Mm. which of these is the evil god that in question well you know it depends what kind of reverse theologian you are (laughs) uh just just as there are countless you know versions of theism so that they're going to be various versions of um, anti-theism Okay, so we have another listener's question here, and this is from uh, Michael James Son. Uh, and this question goes as follows. How does uh, Stephen Law ground evil? How does he know evil exists as opposed to something being essentially not to one's taste? Hmm. On atheism, it seems strong to say something is evil. It points to an objective moral standard. and I'm not sure... It exists on a naturalistic worldview. That's Michael James' song. Hmm. What do you say to that, Stephen? And what do you think of that objection? Um, well, you often find there's a sort of apologetics. Sorry, I don't mean to be rude to poor Michael James' song, but there's a sort of <laughs> apologetics 101 move, which you can find on the internet. Uh, you'll find loads of YouTube mm-hmm. um, uh, clips of people making this point so far as the um, problem of evil is concerned, that atheists can't run the problem of evil because atheists can't allow for the existence of good or evil. They're kind of moral nihilists, or they mm-hmm. should be. And therefore, by admitting that there is evil, they've, all, they've already proven that God exists. There could only be evil if there is a God, because it can only be evil if there is some ultimate objective yardstick of right mm-hmm. and wrong, and that requires the existence of God. So, yeah, this is a sort of stock spanner in the wheel type move that you get um that you pick up quickly if you're doing christian apologetics Mm -hmm. you you know that if you throw this at people that that people are you know people are going to be stopped in their tracks and it's going to take them some time to get through this Mm -hmm. um what's wrong with it is that um in order to run the problem of evil um you don't have to believe in good and evil um it's an internal problem for theism Mm -hmm. the problem of evil uh, and you can point it out, that problem, even if you yourself are not actually committed to the existence of good mm. or evil. As a moral nihilist, I can say, which I'm not, but let's suppose I was, I can say, yeah. I don't believe in good and evil, but you, Mr. Christian, mm-hmm. right, uh, you believe that there are evils and you believe in particular that torturing children pointlessly is wrong, mm-hmm. right? And of course they'll nod and say, well, yes, I, that, is, that is what I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and insofar as that's what they think, they're then in trouble because uh, their God then appears to, to torture children needlessly. Yeah. This appears to be you know, an evil, a gratuitous evil. That, that it is evil is not something I need, even need to accept. As long as they accept it, they're in trouble. Mm-hmm. It's an internal problem for their worldview, not for me. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, in addition to making that basic point, yeah. we could also point out that actually... Um, Michael James Son owes us an argument for why you can't have objective moral values in the mm. absence, you know, if, if there is no God. Where was the argument for that? Well, there wasn't any. This is just the game. It's a stock apologetic move. You just mm-hmm. assert this is the case and then you chuck the ball into the 
your opponent's court and say, you, you explain it to me. You show how, you, you show me how on naturalism there can be, uh, morality. And it is a good question. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge, but, um, and I didn't have a kind of a fully worked out answer so mm. far as morality, mm. moral value is concerned. But, you know, um, I don't need one in order to be able to run the evidential problem yeah. of evil. Mm. Um, and indeed, there are plenty of moral philosophers who, um, certainly are not moral nihilists or moral relativists who believe in objective moral value, who are also, you know, who also accept naturalism. Mm-hmm. It is a, you know, it's a fairly common view. It's not clear to the philosophical community as, as a, um, as a whole that, so this is just obviously the case that mm-hmm. if you're wedded to naturalism, then you can't allow for objective moral values mm. um, yeah. f- um atheist philosophers uh, such as yourself and uh, uh, uh christopher hitchens richard dawkins anyone who's debated uh, the likes of uh, well dawkins famously hasn't but william lane craig again who you debated you're often straw manned with the position something like this on stephen law's account murder and rape are just simply unfashionable they're just uh, mm. things that people don't like we say boo to that and that and appeals to the audience that's what stephen's telling you everybody that there's nothing really wrong with these mm. now your response is well you have to rule out you know you can't rule out that objective moral values and naturalism go hand in hand they, they, they're, they're incompatible so are you required to give a positive account of how these come together, or, do th- or is it on the onus of the theist who says yeah. you have um, you have to rule them all out first? Yeah. Well, how That's do we solve question. this question? Yeah, because I think this takes us to the heart of much of the you know, t- t- to the real issue between atheists and theists. What the theist does very often is this: they will focus on doing two things the first is firing off questions and mysteries you explain this you explain this how is this possible on your worldview blah 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 um and then in combination with that they do a second thing which is whenever you point to evidence against what they believe they cook up uh increasingly sophisticated stories explanations in order to explain away that evidence or account for Mm. that evidence this is the this may not be true of all theists but it is true of very many of them that this is the overall argumentative strategy Mm -hmm. and what you're pointing at here is is an is an example of this they will fire off questions about things like moral value uh consciousness you know how do you accommodate consciousness in your naturalistic worldview and so on Mm -hmm. um you know why the universe exists where can you explain why the universe exists where did it come from no as an atheist you can't i as a religious person i can explain that so immediately that's one up for Mm -hmm. me and so on so there are many classic philosophical conundrums that you can immediately solve if you just posit an invisible being with supernatural powers Mm -hmm. behind the scenes who desires that the universe exists that you know Mm-hmm. is the source of moral value and whatever it might happen to be. And then, uh, when you point to evidence against their particular God, they then come up with all sorts of explanations for why this isn't really good evidence after yeah. all, sceptical theism, theodicies, uh, and so on. So this is the overall strategy, it seems to me, you know, mostly you know, nine times out of ten. Um and I think as an atheist, the right thing to do is to say, I don't know the answers to all of these questions. I don't know what the fundamental basis of morality is. I don't know why the universe exists. Mm-hmm. I don't know the precise relationship between the mind and the body. Um, I should point out, just by, the, by way of a slight digression, that it's a mistake to assume that if you're not a theist, then you're a naturalist. Mm. I'm not wedded to naturalism. Only 50% of professional philosophers even lean towards naturalism, according to the Phil Papers survey, and yet only a tiny proportion are theists. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't assume that atheists are naturalists. I don't have to be a naturalist. So even if naturalism can't accommodate moral value, big deal. I don't have I I was never committed to naturalism in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, But putting putting that to one side then, that's the overall strategy. Um, Explain away the evidence against and keep hammering on the mysteries. Right Now, that's exactly how all sorts of strange belief systems, including conspiracy theories, 
work. It's the same overall rational architecture. Mm -hmm. So suppose I believe in gremlins, right? I can't find my keys. I thought I put them on the mantelpiece. Now they're here, they are on the sofa. <gasps> can you explain that? No, you can't, can you? Uh, it really is quite mysterious. Mm. Um, but if I say gremlins, now I've got an invisible being behind the scenes with mm. supernatural powers or certainly the power to move the keys about and a desire to do that. I can immediately explain what you cannot. If you, once you posit hidden intelligence behind the mm. scenes, you can explain anything you need explaining instantly. It's easy. Okay. Mm. And then when you point out that there's no evidence for gremlins, in fact, there's considerable evidence against gremlins because, you know, we don't find gremlin droppings. What is it that the gremlins eat and so on? I can just endlessly cook up explanations in order to accommodate, um, whatever evidence you might come up against, mm. you, you might put up against my gremlin belief. Um, and in fact, it's true that any belief, no matter how ludicrous, can always depend to be defended ad nauseum if you're prepared to just dig in and endlessly cook up the explanations mm. in that way. Now, clearly that would be a ludicrously, that would be a ludicrous belief, uh, belief system to, to, to believe in gremlins on that basis. Or take 9-11, you know, why did the Twin Towers come down like that? Can you explain it? Well, no, not really. I mean, that is quite striking the way they came mm. down right there. Well, I can explain it. You know, the CIA were in the building. They fixed the explosions. It was a controlled demolition. That would that neatly explains what you can't explain by appealing to hidden agents behind the scenes. Appeal can, to the best explanation. Yeah, it's a form of, of, of argument to the best explanation. And then when I point out that there's abundant evidence that the CIA weren't involved, how did they fix the explosives without anybody saying, you can just then endlessly explain that away. You can just increase the scope of the conspiracy quite easily in order to accommodate that. Um, so, you know, what is it that these belief systems have in common? They have in common two things. You fire off mysteries at people, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're real mysteries. Sometimes they merely appear to be mysteries. Mm. Um, but, but that'll do. Okay. So, you know, young earth creationists, can you explain where, where, where how life emerged, where the first mm -hmm. living things came from? Um, can you explain, uh, you know, all sorts of things about li living things? Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are great mysteries there and we, we don't know the answers. I uh -huh. can explain these things because God created the universe. God created life. God, uh, immediately the problems are solved. When you fire off evidence against my belief that the entire universe is 6,000 years old, I just cook up the explanations. I, you know, the fossil record, I got it covered. There was a biblical mm -hmm. flood and all the animals drowned and they were buried in mud deposits and blah, 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 blah. I'll just keep going like that. Um, it's the same fundamental strategy. Mm. Now that is, now there's something wrong. You can see there's something wrong with this way of thinking and arguing. Mm -hmm. And it is the theistic way of thinking and arguing nine times out of ten. It's the same pattern. Um, we don't need actually to be able to answer these questions in order to be able to quite reasonably rule certain answers out. We can reasonably rule out an evil God on the basis of observations of the world around us, even if I don't know where the universe came from mm -hmm. or what the nature of consciousness is. Okay, an evil God would neatly explain these things, but I can still quite reasonably rule that mm. explanation out. And then similarly then for the good God hypothesis, similarly then for the hypothesis that there are gremlins in my House, similarly then for the, for the view that the CIA, you know, brought the, the Twin Towers down. Um, and similarly, so far as young Earth creation is concerned, I can reasonably rule that out, even if I don't know the answer to the question, where did life come from? So I would encourage theists to look at these other belief systems and ask themselves, to what extent is the way that they're thinking? Does it mirror these, the way that these other folk are thinking? And it mm. seems to me that the, the resemblance is striking. And it should strike them. <laughs> and it should be a cause of concern mm. to them that their thinking um, has that character. Mm. So in response to your 2005 paper, The God of Eth, which is essentially the same as the evil God challenge, but it's a, a thought experiment where in another world, everyone just thinks God is evil. And then people challenge that view with the good God hypothesis. Now, Bergman and Brower in 2007 responded to your paper and they reference Plantinga's reformed epistemology. Mm. So for those who remember episode 11 with Dr. Daniel Hill, um, we spoke about the census divinitatis. Now, this is just the fancy name for the sense of the divine. So I'm born with senses, such as my touch, my sight, my hearing, my taste and feeling. I've got five senses, but I've got the sixth sense as well. Luckily for me, God implanted the sensus divinitatis, and this allows me to know 
lots of truths about the world and God, and he reveals his nature to me through this way. Mm. So I see a tree, and I think, God, what a beautiful tree. God put that tree there. Um, I hear my conscience, and it might tell me a, a moral truth, for example, and that's the sensitive inatatus at work. So it's very rare that I walk down the street, and my senses divinitatis reveals to me, assuming that my uh, my senses, that I haven't been hit on the head in the morning, and mm -hmm. I can trust my senses and my sense divinitatis, mm. it seems that it's always the case that it reveals God is good. It never does it ever tell me that God is evil. Hence why the vast majority of religions across the world have always... There, there are a few examples which uh, which we won't go into, but for the most part, 99.9, .9, infinite 9% 9 of religions think God is good. Now, why the the criticism here is, well, the challenge to the evil God hypothesis is this. Does the sentence of Inosatis mean that it's reasonable to believe in a good God and unreasonable to believe in an evil God? Hmm. Oh, that's very interesting. I think that, um, well, I already mentioned earlier that an evil God might very well want to appear not to be evil. Uh, to deceive us into thinking that he's good because by such means he can actually maximize evil and i explained exactly how he could do that and then we saw that actually when you look at how miracles and religious experiences and scripture and tradition religious traditions are distributed around the globe that's a much better fit for an evil god than a good god um so um yeah so i think an evil god would have very good reasons to pretend to be good uh, which would explain then why we tend to have religious experiences as of a good God. That's entirely consistent with evil, with God being evil, and it is not really much evidence against an evil God. There's a temptation when you believe something, but it's evidentially challenged to say, but I just know. I d so, you know, I believe that my dead auntie is in the room with me. You point out that there's no evidence for this and it's considerable evidence that your dead auntie is in the grave. Um, mm. But I say, no, look, I just know. Now, if actually my dead auntie really is in the room and I really do have a, uh, not a sensus divinitatis, but a sensus spiritualis or whatever it might happen mm. to be, uh, a sense which would allow me to know that dead relatives really are in the room with them, well, then it could be that... Um, if reformed epistemology is true, that I um, can know that my dead auntie is in the room, despite the fact that I have no evidence and you have plenty of evidence against. Um, and in fact, for me to reasonably believe that my dead auntie is in the room, given that I can reasonably believe how things very much appear to me to be the case, um, perhaps even in, in, in the teeth of evidence to the contrary. Yeah, so this is a move that you could make in defense of all sorts of nonsensical, um, ludicrous beliefs. Which is not to say that it's wrong. I mean, you know, maybe there is a God and maybe he has given us a sense of divinitatis and maybe some people really do know by such means that God exists. I can see that that would be a, a way to go in dealing with the, with the, um, the evil good challenge. You might say, well, the reasonableness of my belief in God remains high even if there's good evidence against my belief um, because I have this direct, awareness of god's existence god reveals to me his existence in this in this way and so despite the fact that you can point to the wars and the diseases and the famines and so on still i can know and i can be confident that um that god exists in fact i think plantinga has a a nice analogy to back up this thought actually um suppose that you know you can see an apple in a bowl in front of you well you can see there's an apple there right if somebody came up with lots of evidence for why there couldn't possibly be an apple in the room because, you know, there's a shortage of apples and none of the shops have had apples recently and so on. I mean, that would all be very interesting uh, and it would indeed constitute a challenge to what you believe. But nevertheless, if you can see there's a bloody apple there, <laughs> you can pick it up and smell it and say it's an apple. Um, then it's perfectly reasonable for you to continue to believe that there's an apple there. And so similarly, the religious person may insist that it's reasonable for them to uh, believe uh, in God, despite the fact that there's considerable evidence against mm. the existence of God. So far, so good then for theism. The, 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 the problem now, though, is, I mean, maybe you could deal with the, with the evil God challenge in that way, but it seems to me that, um, just as it would actually be unreasonable for me to continue to believe my dead auntie is in the room, notwithstanding it seems to me that way, given that I have a lot of extra information 
available to me about just how often we get this kind of thing wrong. Um, so it would also be unreasonable for me to con continue to believe in God on that basis. So mm -hmm. the evidence I'm talking about is we know that human beings are horribly prone to false beliefs in invisible agency, you know, mm -hmm. dead aunties, dead relatives, spirits, gods, goblins, whatever it might happen to be, horribly pr prone to holding beliefs in invisible agency on the basis of what seems to them to be some kind of direct and immediate awareness. Mm. It, you know, there is no culture on the face of the planet where you don't find such beliefs justified in such ways. And they are, you know, and clearly, I think we could be very confident the vast majority of those beliefs are not true. Indeed, in many cases, the belief systems contradict each other. But once you know that, then you should immediately be sceptical of anyone who claims to be experiencing God mm. or their dead auntie uh, on the basis of such an experience. And not only should you be sceptical, they should be sceptical too. It is no longer reasonable for them, once they possess this further information, to continue to believe on the basis of that subjective impression, mm -hmm. given that they now know just how unreliable that kind of subjective impression is. So that's what I would say about appeals to the census divinitatis, it seems to me that you can't reasonably continue to believe in a good God, uh, not only because there's abundant evidence that there ain't no good God provided by observation of the evils in the world around you, but also it seems to me that you have very good grounds for distrusting your own experience of such a God. So for somebody listening, Stephen, we have, you've entertained the idea of the evil God hypothesis and the good God hypothesis, but we've given the theist the benefit of the doubt, and that benefit is, I will gift you the omnipotent, omniscient God. Now, you're challenging this third uh, characteristic of God, like it's his moral character. So we have a Jaffa cake, and it's got chocolate, and it's biscuit, and it's got this gooey orange bit in the middle, and you say, right, that gooey orange bit doesn't exist, so therefore the Jaffa cake doesn't exist. But what you're left with is the chocolate and the biscuit. So surely you have to accept that you've given them the chocolate and the biscuit to start off with. So I guess my question is, do you accept that there's an omnipotent, omniscient being? No, I don't. You won't be surprised to hear. But of course... Uh, I, you know, obviously the problem of evil, um, is not any sort of argument really against the existence of such a being. Um, we, we're, we're only targeting a very specific conception of God, all powerful, all knowing, and all good. Mm. Uh, you remove any one of those attributes, I have no argument here in terms of the problem of evil, um, against the God that's left. Um, and if you want to be skeptical about the God that's left, then you'll need other grounds another basis for being sceptical. Um, we'll be looking at other arguments. There are many God hypotheses we can consider. You could have two gods, mm. a good one and an evil one, neither of which is omnipotent. That's the Manichaean view. We haven't crossed that one off our list. St. Augustine was a Manichaean before he became a Christian. Right? It's only when he became a Christian that he was suddenly struck by the problem of evil. There are other, there are other God hypotheses you can go with where there is no such problem, and the Manichaean view uh, is one of those. You make the claim that the world has a lot of evil. There's an incredible amount of evil in the world. Does mm. this put you in the camp of uh, existential pessimism? Are you a, are you pessimistic about the state of affairs you found yourself in, or are you <laughs> optimistic and happy with all the goods that you find? Uh, which wrap up your world? Um, oh, what am I? I don't know what I am actually. Uh, I tend to be quite. I, 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 I look. I look at nature, and I am just. I just, you know, recoil in horror at what I see. Uh, it is appalling. <laughs> mm. um, on the other hand, you know, I look at human beings, and I think, well, they seem to be on a bit of an upward trajectory at the moment. Um, have been for a while because Stephen Pinker has done research, hasn't he, which suggests that, you know, on balance things are getting better and better for humanity, um, at least. So, you know, it's ups, it swings and roundabouts, I guess is what I'm going to say. That's not really an answer at all, is it? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so let's start with a round of concluding remarks. Greg, would you like to start us off? Yeah, thank you, Jack. It's been a very, uh, interesting, uh, conversation. And I think, um, yeah, what are my concluding remarks? Well, I think it's a powerful challenge, and I thought it's a powerful challenge for a while. And I guess maybe I agree with Stephen that we should almost suspend a, uh, an assertion, uh, suspend our um, 
commitment to a belief in one either way. If they're both equal in it, if they're both positions are both equally unreasonable as each other, then we uh, to hold either is to be unreasonable. So we should uh, maybe uh, just suspend judgment in the case. Hmm. Uh, I, I'm going to echo your concluding remarks. Uh, with I uh, should I should say before before I do so that the listener might be uh, worried. Or Mike, I expect a tweet or someone to write in and say, you're just an atheist echo chamber this episode. You, you're all agreeing. You know, Have you really done justice to the other side of the argument? Well, I will say, and I'm going to appeal to reading and research we've done for this episode, which has been in depth. And it it's something we deli- we've deliberated, hasn't it, Greg, for the last 12 months, the Evil God Challenge. And mm-hmm. we've, we've t- un- lifted every stone in the philosophy of religion uh, which we could find. And it doesn't seem like the challenge can be addressed now it, it's in it's, the demands on the theist are so high and it i think that just echoes the strength of the argument and the prob the predicament the theists find themselves in in relation to the evil god challenge now is it too bad though for the theists to to say okay my my faith is unreasonable it's i, I accept the conclusion of the argument mm. it is a kierkegaardian leap of faith you know i may as well wager uh, and bet on a good god it's you know it's more it's in my interests hmm. and not of you i have much sympathy for or follow bertrand russell and the like on this it's true it's true or it's false it's false it's it's one or the other so your wishful thinking is is irrelevant here so on the argument itself i it's something we'll continue to deliberate but i i, I agree with you Stephen, as i'm sure you're about to say in your remarks and greg as well that it doesn't seem like this can be adequately addressed at this point in time no, I mean, there are a lot more options available that we haven't explored yet. Mm. Um, I mean, if I was a theist, I would probably bite the bullet and say, no, we cannot re- we cannot rule out either God hypothesis reasonably on the basis of observation of the world around us. I, th- I think that's, that most people will find that highly counterintuitive, but still, you know, it could be right, couldn't it? And so you could take that line and, but however, that still leaves both God hypotheses level pegging Mm. (laughs) they're still level pegging so how do they then get one of these god hypotheses significantly higher up the scale than the other and they'll need something like maybe a moral argument notoriously crappy arguments of course um Mm. but still maybe maybe some moral argument can uh can be can be made to work Mm. or or some sort of ontological argument maybe something like that could be made to work so you know if I was a theist and I, and I was trying to respond to the to the evil god challenge, I think that's probably the way I would go. But you have to buy a pretty big bullet, mm. it seems to me. Let us pause once again to hear from our fantastic sponsors, the New College of the Humanities. I was born in Canada and went to international schools uh, and I grew up in a few different countries, which was an experience I really enjoyed. And something that I'm enjoying about NCH is the different people here. But as soon as I heard the name New College of the Humanities, I knew it was something that might be interesting to me. The relationship that NCH had with me, even during the application process, was different from all the other universities. It reflects sort of um, values that NCH holds, making sure there's a good community and that people are having fun as well as like being really hard working. AC Graying would come and do a few lectures and those were particularly enjoyable because he really knows what he's talking about and he always seems to get everyone really engaged in these stories that he's telling because he's, Anthony's just got that way about him. When I was applying to NCH, there's obviously uncertainty about what about what you're going to get because it's a new institution and it doesn't have the, the sort of established reputation that some of the other universities I was applying to had. It's obviously a, a really big package that NCH is trying to deliver to students and I mean, it comes off really well when you're telling someone about that as a pitch for university but to see that it, it actually works in practice um, was definitely not surprising but oh this institution is actually doing everything that it set out that they were going to do. You can still apply directly or through UCAS to NCH London for 2018 entry and be considered for a scholarship worth up to £2,000 per year. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk forward slash pansycast. NCH London, unique degrees for curious minds. Okay, let's head back over to the discussion. Gregory's Law. So the rules of the game are very simple. 
I'm going to ask you, Greg, a question about Stephen Law, and you've got to guess the answer correctly. Get the question right, and you get a point, and get it wrong, and Stephen gets a point, and we're going to play first to three. Here, the prize, as always, is a Pan Psychast t-shirt. So, Stephen Law agrees more with which work of Ludwig Wittgenstein, A, the Tractatus, or B, the Philosophical Investigations? You can't, you can't analyse his reaction to the, to the responses either. Oh, that's what matters. A, a, a or B. <laughs> part of my tactic. I've got a census divinitas. <laughs> well, let's see if it works. <laughs> I've got privileged access to other people's minds. Um, B, the philosophical investigations. Stephen? Yes, it's the investigations. I'm much, much more of a fan of the later work. Yeah. Very nice. 1 0 to Greg. True or false? Stephen Law is a closet pan psychist. False. Correct. I am not. Once again, that's 2-0 to Greg. I'll give a more difficult one, perhaps. Mm. Or we'll play first. Maybe we'll play... Oh, we're already doing first three. Another philosophy of mine one here. When Mary leaves her black and white room and sees the colour red for the first time, Stephen thinks A, she learns something new, or B, she doesn't learn something new. Stephen thinks she doesn't learn something new. Yeah. Well, see... On this one, I don't know what I think. Oh, really? See, yeah, I'm... Uh, false psychotomy. There's a false but... <laughs> Yeah. I'm not really sure what to think about um, the black and white room case. So, Sorry, Greg, you don't get that one. So <clears> we're going 2-1. Uh, there is a runaway trolley barreling down the railway tracks. Ahead on the tracks, there are five people tied up and unable to move. The trolley is heading straight towards them, and Stephen is standing some distance off in the train yard next to a lever. If he pulls the lever, the trolley will switch to a different set of tracks. But here's the catch. On the second track, there is one person tied up. What does Stephen do? Does he A, let the trolley run over five people, or does he flip the switch and allow it to kill one person? Flips the switch? Yes, I'm a flipper. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Greg, you uh, you win this You win this game. Unfortunately, though... Stephen. Fortunately, that the world isn't as uh, rosy as you thought it was, and God is evil after all. So you don't win. It was all a ploy to get you to think you were going to win, and then <laughs> I took it away from you at the last moment. Stephen, you prize the Pan Psychast T-shirt. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Pan Psychast. If you haven't left us a review, please do so on iTunes. Tweet us your thoughts at the Pan Psychast. All of the reading, including links to all of Stephen's work, his blog, um, some links to his papers, including the Evil God Challenge, can be found on our website, thepansycast.com. A link is in the iTunes description. You can also find more about Stephen Law and his work at stephenlaw.org. And you can also follow him on Twitter at StephenLaw60. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to the beautiful, soothing voices of Mr. Gregory Miller. Thank you for listening. Dr. Stephen Law. Thank you for listening. And me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week for episode 30 on Friedrich Nietzsche.